Okay, so chapter 29 is a, about vertebrates, but I'm going to back it up a bit and talk about the chordates as a phylum first. I'm a little disappointed in this picture for this chapter because, once again, you get the impression that most animals are mammals, so they show the tiger and the gorilla, which are mammals, and the vertebrates include a lot more than that. Um, the fish are vertebrates that outnumber the mammals, the reptiles, and the amphibians by quite a bit. So in any case, they, um, they show mostly mammals here and then a warm-blooded reptile, which is a bird. So, but let's go back to phylum chordata. At the end of chapter 28, we looked at phylum echinodermata, which is shown here is a deuterostome. So starting from the deuterostomes as the root of this tree, you can see it splits. Now echinodermata, of course, it has its own branches. And so they've summarized it here just writing echinodermata here because we're going to focus on the phylum chordata. So where this, this separation is here, you know, echinodermata have the derived trait of the water vascular system and the pentaradial symmetry and those types of things. The chordates over here have their derived traits and the, the group is named for the notochord. You notice that chord is spelled C-H-O-R-D for notochord. So that's where the name of the group comes from. But all the chordates also have, as a derived trait, the nerve chord, and that's C-O-R-D. And that's a dorsal nerve cord that runs down the backside of the animal next to um, the notochord. Then they also have, chordates also have a post anal tail. That means a tail or an extension of the notochord that goes past the anus. So if you want to find a dog's anus, you lift up the tail and you find it. So a lot of animals, animals that have a postanal tail, you just lift up the tail and the anus is under there. The last uh, characteristic of chordates is called pharyngeal gill slits or pharyngeal pouches, but I'm saying pharyngeal, P-H-A-R-Y-N-G-E-A-L. That refers to the pharynx, which is uh, before... In the human, it's that section of the throat before food goes down the esophagus or air goes down the trachea. It's that common area right before that. And so chordates have those four characteristics, notochord, dorsal nerve cord, pharyngeal gill slits, and the postanal tail. But the rule for the noto, excuse me, the rule for the chordates is all animals in the group must have these traits at least at some point in their life, usually in embryonic development. So we have a notochord when we are embryos, human embryos. We have a nerve cord that lasts through our whole life. We have pharyngeal slits as an embryo, and we have a postanal tail as an embryo. But as adults, we don't have uh, any of those except for the nerve cord. So in any case, that's, those are the derived traits of the chordates. And then it splits again. So we're going to follow really what this evolutionary tree is is doing is following all the steps, all the traits that lead to mammals. Um, because each of these other branches, of course, branches off in 
its own way, but we're really following all the branches that lead to mammals. So the chordates split into um, some of the primitive chordates are the lancelets. You don't need to know the scientific name, just the um, common name here. The lancelets and the tunicates. So these are appear in your lab for Animal Kingdom Part 3, lancelets and tunicates. Tunicates are also called sea squirts. And so those are very primitive. Pretty quickly you have the evolution um, pretty quickly, almost a one, two, three, although there is an order. Head evolve or cranium evolves first. They say head, I say cranium, skull. They should really say skull. The vertebral column next, and then the jaw third. And so you remember from the from the plant chapters that um, roots, stems, and leaves had a certain order of evolution. And in this case, these three have a certain order of evolution. So, but it's pretty a pretty short period. Um, and so you do have some animals that have one or two of these, but not all three, like the hagfish has a cranium, but no backbone and no jaw. The lampreys have a cranium and a backbone, but no jaw. And so these guys are called the jawless fish. Jawless. We'll see those again later. And then the, the appearance of the jaw, the jaw bone is a separate piece it's hinged on part of the cranium, but it's, it evolved as a separate piece. And that allowed for some serious predation for these animals. And the first group that we will look at are the chondrichthys. Those are the cartilaginous fish, so sharks and rays. And then we have the ray fin fish. Those are the ones that you're going to probably recognize the most. Um, these are bony fish. And then you have some um, kind of unusual fish because the evolution of um, the lungs, I think the lungs is misplaced here because ray fin fish don't have lungs. We need to go down here. Lungs. Uh, lung fish. Yeah, these look like these are a little bit offset here. So let's fix this. Um, the amniote egg is definitely here. Four legs is definitely here. So I don't know why they have four limbs and four legs separate here. Um, but anyway, lungs don't appear until about here. So you have some animals that are called lungfish, and they're pretty, there's lungs right there. They're pretty odd because they can breathe air. And, um, but when you get down here, lungs and four legs, those lead you to some of the animals that you recognize quite a bit, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. We're not going to talk a lot about coelacanths or lungfish. Um, and even this diagram is overly simplified, but we're going to hit on some of the main um, groups. All the chordates are deuterostomes, so we are a chordate, so we're a deuterostome. Um, and we will look at the four main derived traits that define the chordates that I mentioned. And then we'll talk about head, backbone, jaw a little bit. And then lungs, four legs, amniotic egg, and milk. All right, so it's the order of the derived traits as they evolved. 
And the, the derived traits, you'll remember, define the name of the clade. So an animal with a vertebral column, or the group that has the vertebral column, are called the vertebrata. The group that has the amniotic egg is called the amniota. All right, if you have mammary glands that make milk, you're a mammal. So we'll see that um, reflected in the group names. So like I said, there are four features of chordates. They're shown here, notochord, nerve cord, postanal tail, and pharyngeal slits. The nerve cord is hollow. So you probably know that our spinal cord is hollow and it's full of fluid. And if you get a spinal tap, they stick a needle into that space and get some of that fluid out. It's very tricky. Um, so those are the four traits that, that have to appear at least some point in the animal's development in order to be classified as a chordate. So in lab, you'll get to see um, a sea squirt. It's a tunicate, the weirdest animal. Um, but they do move. They do have the four characteristics of chordates when they are at larval stage. And that, then when they become adults, they are just odd looking guys. You might mistake them for like a sponge, except when you touch them, they move. So, uh, but visually they look a little bit like a sponge. So they're a little bit, they're odd. They live in water or in very, you know, sometimes they live on the, where the tide comes in and out um, somewhere, but they need a lot of water. Lancelets, this is another um, invertebrate chordate. It has all the characteristics. And this guy, he's only about a centimeter long, and he will burrow down into the sand and stick his head up out of the sand and just catch food. But he's very simple. It's called a lancelet. All right. So when the, um, when the series of, when the uh, traits, cranium, skull, backbone, and then jaw evolved, when you ha that means you have an animal that has a cranium but no backbone and no skull. That, that helps you know what came first, or at least it gives you a hypothesis. So the cranium is the skull. Here they show the cranium of a uh, um, Dunkleosteus, which is not just a craniate, but also has a jaw. But they're showing, they're trying to show the cranium. And, you know, so it's some kind of covering over the brain, some kind of protective covering. It can be made of cartilage. It can be made of mineralized bone, but it's defined as some kind of protective covering over the brain, the top part. So there are some animals, because the cranium evolved first, it's not that surprising that we do have extant animals that have a cranium, but no backbone and no jaw. So these are called hagfish. And they are jawless fish, but they do have a little bit of a, uh, I guess you could call it a helmet over their brain, inside their skin. These live in the ocean. If you go deep sea fishing, I've heard you can catch these. I don't know if you eat them, but um, they, they put out a lot of slime. All right. Now, the, with the evolution of the spinal column, we, we have now the definition of what we call subphylum vertebrata. So that's very important. Um, so they have, not only do they have the spinal column, but the spinal column, the vertebrae, surround the nerve cord. So the bones of the vertebrae create an enclosure that surround the nerve cord. Now there are gaps in between the vertebrae and so if you need to stick a needle into somebody's nerve cord you can but you have to get the needle between the vertebrae. So it creates kind of a cage structure that protects the backbone and yet still allows everything to be flexible. So if you 
are a vertebrate, it means you have a cranium because the cranium evolved first and then vertebrae. So vertebrates are all craniates. Here's a picture of a fish skeleton. This one does have a jaw, but... So the animal that has a cranium and a backbone but no jaw is called the lamprey. Now, don't pay attention to this guy here. This is not the lamprey. This is the lamprey. So he is kind of this scary, I don't know, people think he's kind of scary looking. He doesn't have a jaw, but he does have a cranium, a cover over his brain, and a backbone. And his mouth has these little spiky structures that let it suck onto another animal. So he's sucking this trout's blood. So. All right, and then after that, we have the evolution of the jaw. The first fish, like the lamprey and the hagfish, had no jaw, so just kind of a round mouth, and they would just have to suck on to things. But, and we call those the agnathans, the jawless fish, so the lamprey and the hagfish. And with the evolution of the jaw, we have a group called the nathostomes that have the and that means jawed mouth. You remember stone means mouth, like protostome and deuterostome? It means mouth first, mouth second. So in this case, natho refers to the jaw. Sometimes people think of the word gnaw, and it probably comes from the same root. That kind of reminds you of the mouth or the jaw. You chew on something, you gnaw. But anyway. So the, um, the jaw. And here's Dunkleosteus again. Uh, he's just horrifying, isn't he? All right. He lived about 380 million years ago. We don't think he still exists. We haven't found him. So that makes we usually things that we haven't found, we assume are extinct. Sometimes we're wrong with those assumptions, but... Okay, so the modern fish have a cranium, a backbone, and a jaw. And so it falls into a group. The fish, in general, are called the Pisces. And I think that is a super class, but we're not going to get too worried about the taxonomic categories. But Pisces is the clade of fish. And then that divides into two groups, the chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish, the fish that have a cartilage skeleton. But what's interesting about the cartilaginous fish is their entire skeleton is made of cartilage, except the jawbone itself is made of hard mineralized bone. And that is kind of funny, except you do know that they evolve separately, so it does. It may not be that surprising when you know that. So the chondrichthians are the sharks and rays and skates. The other group of Pisces are the osteichthians, and by the way, ichthys is Greek for fish. And then, if you've had any anatomy, you might know these roots: a chondrocyte. That, that root word means cartilage, and osteocyte would refer to a cell that makes bone. So the roots here um, are helpful if you know some of that anatomy. If not, you can just memorize it. But bony fish meaning mineralized bone, meaning calcium, phosphorus, and such. Now cartilage can be very hard, but mineralized bone is, is considered the harder material. So all the fish have um, the vertebral column, except the hagfish, jaws, except hagfish and lamprey, internal gills. A lot of fish have to open their mouth and let the, let the um, water go through their mouth over their gill slits and then out of the body through the gill slits. They have a single loop blood circulation with a two-chambered heart. 
So what that means is the blood goes in one loop around the body, a little bit like it does in the earthworm, and just in one spot, there's a little bit of a more muscularized spot on the vessel where the, water, where the blood, it, let's say the blood is flowing this way, and it collects here, and then this contracts and pushes it here, and then this contracts and pushes it out. So that little pump keeps things moving in the circuit. Right. And then nutritional deficiencies, this is just one of those things that we've figured out. They cannot synthesize, fish cannot synthesize phenylalanine, tryptophan, or tyrosine. So they have to get those amino acids from their diet. And it wouldn't surprise you knowing how evolution works that that becomes a trait that we all have because we all evolved. We all um, have this fish as our ancestor. So here's just some pictures of some chondrichthians. So sharks, rays, and skates. You're not going to have to identify them visually, but just so you know what, what we're talking about. The osteichthians, these are the bony fish. The difference between, there are a couple types of bony fish. Ray fin fish are by far the most numerous. There's like, oh, I don't know. 25,000 species of ray fin fish. There's a lot. Um, and lobe fin fish now are much more rare, but they are believed to be the lineage that leads to the tetrapods, the land animals. And that's because of the way the fin is. Ray fin fish, which makes up a huge you know, majority of all fish um, that we have now, their fins... Here, I'll draw a fish. Their fins connect to the body, and they're kind of wide, and they have these rays, these bony um, structures that hold up the, the fin. This is a terrible drawing. But these are the rays. Okay. And But the lobe fin fish, and I think there's a picture on the next slide, so you'll get to see something better. They have this this bone and then they have the rays and the way I'm drawing this is kind of ridiculous but anyway but they have this bone structure um, and then what they call a lobe so instead of just the ray fin there's a more of a, a bone a thick bone structure here all right. So anyway, um, that's what we're talking about. So they just happen to have a really a somewhat um, diverse structure compared to the the ray fin fish, and that is what we think, um, and we have evidence uh, that we will talk about um, makes the low fin fish the ancestor of the tetrapods, the amphibians being the first group that walked on land. So here's a picture. Yeah, this is much better. All right, so here's a ray fin fish. You can see that the ray fin attaches in a, on a longer space along here. And then these rays are just these bony structures. And he can move this fin, but this guy has this, this thicker bone structure here and then the part that has the rays. So these are called lobe fins. He has lots of them. All right. And then on the other side, too. So this is a salmon, modern-day salmon. This is a modern-day coelacanth. And, um, but they kind of give us an image of what the ancestral um, lobe fin fish might have looked like. All right, so I'm going to stop here, and then we're going to pick up in the next lecture segment on how the lobe fin fish, we think, evolved into the first amphibians. It's a really good story, actually, because uh, until about 20 years ago, we really didn't have all the fossil evidence. We still don't have all of it, but we didn't have even enough to uh, 
put together a story that seems reasonable to scientists.